Welcome to a series that's providing a space for me to work out my ideas pertaining to a phenomenology of evil, what I'm calling the Thanatonic Phenomenon. This video is part four of a section that is addressing Jean-Luc Marion's phenomenology of givenness. Part one offered an introduction through the description of my encounter with Pollock's painting. Part two addressed what may be considered the central foil for this phenomenology, a modern metaphysics that seeks a grounded certainty. The last video, part three, moved into the first principle, what shows itself first gives itself. You can find links to each of these videos below. Today I'll be addressing the second and most fundamental principle, so much reduction, so much givenness. I'm providing you this a summary today as I had several more viewers stop by uh, for the last video than previous ones. And it occurred to me that it might have been like jumping in a river midstream if you didn't have the context of why I'm creating these videos. I invite you all to feel free to leave questions and comments below. Even uh, feedback, constructive criticism is welcomed. And if you wish to continue seeing more and want to support this work so it can perhaps be further improved upon, please consider subscribing to my channel. One could reasonably assume that a science of appearances takes things as they immediately appear to us. However, how things first appear to us is always already mediated by what does not appear, to the point of mistaking things only as their mediations. What initially comes across as immediate is not immediate because it's always superseded by mediation. Like a thief in the night, mediation surreptitiously and unexpectedly obscures givenness. The given, in contrast, doesn't give itself in the so-called immediacy of sense data, despite arriving with a, an unconditioned and indubitable facticity. Immediacy is never given, and the given is never immediately available. If it were, we would likely flee from it, as uh, Kierkegaard says in Sickness Unto Death, all immediacy is anxiety. Consequently, a philosophy aiming to arrive at the things themselves finds themselves before an immense task of identifying and, to the degree it's possible, suspending these implicit mediations. To be led back requires a mediator as well, however, but one that acts only to fend off other mediators, sort of like a referee whose main purpose is not to influence the outcome of the game, but only to maintain its integrity. And so the principle, what shows itself first gives itself, requires a method that can lead one from showing to giving. The more rigorously that method is deployed, the clearer the connection becomes. This is the role of the reduction in phenomenology, and it's responsible for the endless task of identifying and suspending the implicit mediations that often pass themselves off as immediate. The reduction doesn't establish a ground for the givens, neither causing them nor organizing them according to predetermined conditions. Rather, it serves as a clearing that dissolves aporias and suspends theories from the natural attitude. As much as possible, it lets appearances manifest in lived experience. The reduction operates by negating all negations to the phenomenon and then getting out of its way. As such, it should be considered a counter-method that puts itself out of play once it's done its job. It's what makes manifest givenness, giving rise to the principle, so much reduction, so much givenness. Unlike principles that preceded it in the history of phenomenology, this principle unequivocally links givenness to the reduction. However, this priority on an understanding of the reduction is not something that one would find explicit in the history of phenomenology. And admittedly, the reduction has been a point of contention within this discipline, even from its very beginning with attempts to radicalize it or remove it. It's been considered, as Heidegger said, the magic word and stumbling block for phenomenology scandalizing this field of inquiry with the specter of an irrationality. 
However, Jean-Luc Marion argues that, in practice, some form of the reduction inevitably appears, whether the natural attitude for Husserl, the antical for Heidegger, essences for Sartre, or ontology for Levinas. Let's briefly then consider two major developments which Marion names the transcendental reduction and existential reduction. The broadening of intuition beyond the sensuous may be considered the greatest breakthrough in Husserl's phenomenology. It freed intuition from scientific evidence, distinguished phenomenology from empiricism, and instead inaugurated a kind of radical empiricism not beholden to abstracting notions concerning the sensorial. Consequently, phenomena include both sensible and categorial intuitions. The sensorial and categorial are united under their defining requirement that all intuitions result from givenness. However, Marian identifies a twofold imprecision in Husserl concerning the confusion between objects and beings and the relation between givenness and objects. He also accuses Husserl of having recoiled from his own advances by imposing antecedent limitations upon phenomena. Those limitations can be described in three ways. First, phenomena must present themselves in the actuality of presence. Second, phenomena must be predicated upon intuition. And third, phenomena must be determined by lived experience rather than how they appear in themselves. The consequence of these restrictions is an allowance for only flat phenomena, as Marion puts it. That is, those presented perfectly and objectively in presence. Husserl ultimately settles on objectness as the model for phenomenology. The transcendental reduction then leads an intending ego back to the essential aspects of a lived experience presented in actuality from within the horizon of objectivity. In raising the ego to transcendental status, this reduction excludes the sedimentation of meanings given through a world that precedes and gives rise to the very possibility of knowing at all. And consequently, the transcendental reduction excludes the way beings appear to us in and through their being. It will be the existential reduction that claims to overcome these limitations by offering an even greater broadening of the reduction. I should mention here before moving on that this history of phenomenology is developed in Marianne's book, Reduction and Givenness. And it's not without controversy the way in which these, this history is being interpreted. And I'm not here to provide a critique of it or to even examine what critiques have been leveled against it, only to give a general summary of the position itself. The existential reduction, like the transcendental one, is a phenomenological method for leading back to the things themselves. In contrast, it deploys a redoubled reduction that allows for a more three-dimensional phenomenon. First, phenomena disclose themselves as beings that are led back to the disclosing and covering activity of being itself from within the horizon of time. Second, the meaning of being is questioned. And this questioning discloses its difference from beings. Like the broadening of intuition, the ontological difference between being and beings represents a breakthrough, overcoming a concealment of it by the history of metaphysics. Now, being itself is never directly studied as a phenomenon, only indirectly in and through beings. This in turn requires analyzing the being for whom beings and their being is a question. Dasein is the one who deploys this redoubled reduction. Its ontical distinction is its orientation toward the ontological, giving it unique access to being. Dasein is the being capable of questioning and understanding the meaning of being in and from its situatedness in the world. It's the worker of ontological difference in virtue of its intrinsic capacity for being the kind of being that can transcend beings in projecting itself through anticipatory resoluteness and care toward its own possibilities, and especially the possibility of impossibility, that being death. As with Husserl, Marianne identifies a recoiling from the primacy of givenness by Heidegger. 
In particular, he identifies three limitations with Heidegger's existential reduction. First, at least for the early Heidegger, this reduction suggests that the ontological difference between being and beings is predicated upon a being, in this case, Dasein, and its difference from other beings. Second, after being in time, Dasein has this capacity not from some antecedent priority, but by the workings of the event or advent, Ereignis, of being itself, reaffirming the priority of the ontological over the ontic. He accuses Heidegger of contradiction when Heidegger identifies the S of es gibt as Ereignis. Ereignis becomes how being is given, and this ends up disposing of the priority of givenness in favor of a giver, at least according to Marianne's read of it. Third, by leading appearances back to being, whether through the initiation of Dasein or through Ereignis, this reduction excludes what falls outside the horizon of time, and so cannot be circumscribed within being. Consequently, Marian proposes a third possibility, one considered more fundamental than objects and beings. He argues that the reduction should lead back to givenness. A reduction to givenness requires that nothing appear except as it is given. So is this possible? Since a reduction to givenness entails a return to the manner of appearing of appearances, we would have to begin first with the surface of the given, the appearance in lived experience, and lead it to an appearing thoroughly determined by givenness. To be given within givenness cannot be thought in terms of a subsisting object, nor in terms of its utility, as both deploy concepts or goals extrinsic to the given itself. Even to consider it as manifesting the truth of beings redirects the given to appear on behalf of another rather than to give itself from itself. As we saw in the encounter with uh, Pollock's painting that I described in part one, only the effect itself defines the phenomenality of the given. The reduction thus reduces the given to its effects. And it's the effects that characterizes the givenness of the given. The unfolding of givenness leads the given to show itself. This reduction frees the given from every thesis of a transcendental origin. It also frees givenness from the constraints of intentionality as well as intuition. Now, that might surprise some of you um, who have assumed that a phenomenology of givenness is all about intuition. However, not all phenomena give themselves in intuition, despite one of the most notable concepts coming out of this phenomenology being the saturated phenomenon. There are other modes of givenness that deliver a deficit of intuition, such as the nothing or death, or even a deferred intuition, as in the case of difference. All these phenomena continue to give themselves though they don't meet the standard criteria for a fulfilling intuition. This will be a very important point that I'll return to next chapter as I discuss the phenomenon of evil, because it, too, doesn't neatly fit within the criteria of saturated phenomena, nor does it fit within what, what Marion calls denigative givenness. And so the reduction provokes givenness by bracketing all transcendencies and every thesis concerning the world. The more thorough this reduction is performed, the more fully givenness can shine through the given phenomenon. But it's not enough to engage in the reduction. One must also describe the given. Phenomenology is, after all, concerned with addressing the how of phenomena. So upon deploying the reduction, then, what are the characteristics of the given as it unfolds givenness? The reduction to givenness allows the determinations of given phenomena to be described in their radical, irrevocable, and intrinsic imminence. These determinations concern the manner of arrival, encounter, exposure, and reception of the given phenomenon. To remain within givenness requires describing these characteristics in their contingency 
and as appearing from elsewhere. Contingency addresses how a possible given through a necessary givenness affects the one who encounters it. This contingency expresses itself in three figures. First, the given phenomena may arrive to me. This is the least impactful form of contingency as it can be received as an intentional object of lived experience by a disengaged spectator. It demands little other than an acknowledgement of its presence. Second, the given phenomena may come upon me. Here, one no longer remains a purely disengaged spectator. Instead, it requires interacting with it to deploy its functionality, such as the case with equipment. The car can be viewed as an object, but if I wish to use it, I have to accommodate myself to its operational demands. Third, the given phenomena may impose themselves upon me. Here, I'm no longer a mere observer nor manipulator. Instead, I find myself inhabited by them as they absorb me in another world, carrying me outside of myself. The example that Marin uses is watching a television show. Yes, the television could be seen as uh, an object, or it could be a kind of equipment that I use, but when I'm watching a television show, I'm absorbed into the world that it is delivering to me. And these three contingencies could be I apply to all sorts of situations. So a person, for example, could be looked at as an object, as uh, looked at politically as a means to an end, or if they become someone we fall in love with, and now I'm subjected to them in a manner that's far more absorbing and finding myself in their world rather than necessarily bringing them into mine. Another intrinsic characteristic of the given is its mode of appearing outside my horizons of understanding. It is an alterity of the given. The appearance from elsewhere of the given doesn't concern geometric space nor refer to causal origins or agency. Rather, it's an intrinsic characteristic of a given that doesn't depend on me for its appearance. The coming from elsewhere, what Marianne calls dair, designates a phenomenological distance that makes itself felt without ever identifying itself. It serves as an unknowable point of reference that attests to my descendered existence. The contingency and elsewhere of the given phenomena are further qualified in terms of four determinations. First, the given in its essential contingency arrives by an unforeseeable initiative. It comes without warning or cause at a time and place of its choosing. It is in this arrival that no phenomenon can ever be considered equal to another because no other phenomena could ever arrive at this place at this time in the same exact way. It's thus singular and unrepeatable. Second, one encounters the arriving phenomenon in its indubitable facticity. When it lands unpredictably, it lands with an unmistakable weight upon me. Third, one is exposed to this facticity of the arriving phenomenon as an incident. Here, the phenomenon makes its first appearance on the stage of consciousness as a lived experience, whereas the encounter of facticity addresses the phenomenon's initial contact. The exposure of the incident concerns being subject to the effects of the phenomenon. The sun shining its undeniable rays upon me as an encounter, then warms my skin, exposure. The exposure of the incident accomplishes the showing itself in what gives itself. That showing is not some universal form of the phenomenon, but this phenomenon's distinct arising. And it's for this reason Marion will say that this reverses one of the common metaphysical ways of thinking going back to Aristotle, which is the priority of substances over accidents. Instead, we could think of accidents being the normative form of the phenomenon and substances being sort of an accident of the accident, an abstraction from the unpredictable arrival of the phenomenon. Fourth, the given phenomenon is received by accommodating oneself to it through an anamorphosis. In the unexpected arrival of its undeniable showing, the phenomenon crosses a distance, arriving from a place other than my own. This is the elsewhere. It requires 
then that I see it from the perspective it demands of me, from where it comes from. It does this because I can't produce it, and so I don't decide how it's supposed to be seen. Instead, it decides how I will see it, requiring a modification of my field of vision. As such, anamorphosis is a characteristic that attests to givenness most fully. To extend the metaphor of the sun a little further, the encounter with and exposure to the sun leaves me no longer in an absolute position to decide where to go, but I have to travel to either where its rays land or, if overexposed, to flee from it by taking shelter where it's not. It's by means of the reduction we can arrive at such a description of the given. Without it, phenomena would not be thought in terms of givenness, but in terms of their causalities, whether material, efficient, formal, or final. In performing the reduction, we can observe general characteristics of all phenomena, regardless of their intensity, that is, regardless of whether they arrive to me, come upon me, or impose themselves upon me. These descriptions consistently reinforce the priority of the phenomenon to give itself from itself. These determinations are also frequently skipped over in commentaries on this phenomenology, often in favor of the more recognizable concept of the saturated phenomenon. However, as important as saturated phenomena are in establishing a new norm for phenomenology, the determinations of the given provide just as an important contribution, if not more so. And not considering the character of the given risk dislodging saturated phenomena from their intelligibility within the field of phenomenology. By ignoring these determinations, critiques leveled against the saturated phenomenon dislodge it from its phenomenological rootedness and so find themselves attacking a straw man at times rather than the actual concept. The summation of these determinations is found in the concept of the event, which is both a determination and model for givenness. From a metaphysical lens, The event is the definition of impossibility because it accomplishes itself without cause or reason. Indeed, it reverses the relation between cause and effect in several ways. First, the effect of the event is always greater than the summation of its identifiable causes. Second, the effect of the event always appears before causes. Causes flow from the effects. Nietzsche makes a similar claim when he states that the fundamental fact of inner experience is that the cause is imagined after the effect has taken place. Causes are constructed first from the given datum of experience, which give reason to offer causes in the first place. To quote Marian, For without the effect, there could be neither meaning nor necessity to inquiring after any cause whatsoever. Causes, therefore, serve the purely epistemological function of subsequently producing the evidence for the effects. This gives rise to three positive characteristics of the event. First, the event is unrepeatable in its uniqueness and temporality. It's individualized in its distinct arrival and exposure, and temporalized in the moment of its encounter and reception. Second, the event is excessive in relation to its antecedents, to the point that causes abandon the event to its own self-manifestation. Third, the event is possible, or rather, more accurately, inaugurates a new possibility by imposing the impossible. To return to my initial example of Pollock's painting, when passing through the causes of the painting's aesthetic effect upon me, I was eventually led to what prompted my search for causes, that being the effect itself. The reduction works to suspend our passing over of this effect so quickly, and instead to inquire into the characteristics of it. Doing so led to a consideration of what the painting gives from itself, and not what is before it, the material causes of its matter or the efficient cause of the painter's efforts, nor what's beyond it, the final cause of its economic or social utility, nor what's behind it, the formal cause of its intelligibility, and not even in its bringing forth, that is, the gathering of the four causes to disclose the truth of being. Instead, the effect of the painting imposed itself upon me as an event that was unforeseeable and non-repeatable. 
The initial encounter left me frozen and stunned before a bedazzling display that was as indubitable as it was formless. It, it was received based not on my aims, but on how the painting directed me toward its accomplishment. And so the reduction to givenness displaces the priority accorded to causes in leading me from the painting's appearance to its manner of appearing. To conclude today, the eventimental character of the phenomena is not static, but varies, as we said, according to degrees of intensity, or we might say degrees of givenness. Some phenomena arrive, others come upon me, and some even impose themselves upon me. These varying degrees of givenness can be measured by the intensity of manifestation over and beyond any concepts we could apply to them, leading to yet another principle. So much givenness, so much manifestation. And we'll pick up this principle in the next video when we discuss satri phenomena and the kind of subjectivity that emerges upon receiving these phenomena. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Again, please feel free to leave comments or questions below. And uh, I look forward to being with you again next time.